Pastor Carl White here. Thank you for joining us for our radio broadcast on WMOX. For the duration of the coronavirus, we will hold one service at 10 a.m. at our church located at 7330 Highway 493 in Meridian. You can join us one of two ways. You can wear a mask and come in where we practice social distancing and be a part of our worship in person, or you can drive in and sit in your car and turn your radio to the FM frequency that we would give you and be a part of our service. Either way, we would love to have you. We are also broadcasting a Sunday School lesson on YouTube uh, every week. You can find it on our Facebook page or go to the YouTube page and just look up Grace Fellowship Baptist Church. I'm so glad you're here. I would love to hear from you. You can contact me through our Facebook page. Now let's join our worship service, which is in progress. Our scripture reading is going to be from Colossians chapter 3. Uh, If you can, would you stand with me and we will read God's word. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Let's pray together. Father, that song speaks to my heart. I I hope and trust that it, as it has through the ages, speaks to our hearts to praise the Lord. I'll be honest with you that that's difficult. It's hard to to think about giving Thanksgiving because it's been a rough year. It's been a terrible year and heartache and difficulty and world calamity. And Father, it is... Hard. It takes great faith, it takes great discipline from your people to in the midst of the chaos of what our life is like right now to give thanks, to praise the Lord for the good things that you have done. And yet we can because if nothing else, we can see the good things you have done through Christ. You've given salvation to those who don't deserve it. You've given hope and eternal life to those who don't deserve it. You've given me life and hope and I don't deserve it so God we praise you for that we thank you for that we thank you for who Jesus is and what he's done for us and God I ask that you would give give me and give each of us give this church a way to examine what's happening in our lives this year and to see where your hand has been there to provide to protect where your spirit has provided a comfort and a peace that is beyond the circumstances of our life, where we see glimmers of of hope in the working of your kingdom in places where we, we don't expect to see them. God, this week, give us the ability to reflect, to look back on this year and to see where your hand has been, and in that, be able to give thanks. To give thanks for the fact that you are good and you are there always. You are faithful to your people, even when we don't see it, even when we don't know it. So God, reveal to us where you have been faithful and give us the ability to thank you for it. I ask that you would bless the the study of your word today as we look at this Thanksgiving uh, hymn. Uh, It's unusual, it's weird, it's a difficult and weird passage for us. But God, in it, I ask that you would bring Thanksgiving up from our soul an expression of gratitude for how wonderful you are. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, who is our Lord and our hope. Amen.
Charles, I know you had to be impressed that I remembered to do the doxology this week. So <laughs> I saw her felt him stand up behind me. And I was like, oh, I got this one. I'm ready. Um, our uh, scripture lesson for today is from Psalm 118. Uh, if you will prepare to read along with me. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Give thanks to Yahweh, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, His love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, His love endures forever. Let those who fear Yahweh say, His love endures forever. When hard pressed, I cried to Yahweh, and He brought me into a spacious place. Yahweh is with me, and I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Yahweh is with me. He is my helper. I look in triumph on my enemies. It is better to take refuge in Yahweh than to trust in humans. It is better to take refuge in Yahweh than to trust in princes. All the nations surround me, but in the name of Yahweh I cut them down. They surrounded me on every side, but in the name of Yahweh I cut them down. They swarmed around me like bees, but they were consumed as quickly as burning thorns. In the name of Yahweh I cut them down. I was pushed back and about to fall, but Yahweh helped me. Yahweh is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. Yahweh's right hand has done mighty things. Yahweh's right hand is lifted high. Yahweh's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die, but live and will proclaim what Yahweh has done. Yahweh has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of the righteous. And I will enter and give thanks to Yahweh. This is the gate of Yahweh through which the righteous may enter. And I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Yahweh has done this and it's marvelous in our eyes. Yahweh has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Yahweh, save us. Yahweh, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh. From the house of Yahweh we bless you. Yahweh is God, and he has made his light shine on us with bowls in his hand, joined in the festal possession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to Yahweh, for he is good, and his love endures forever. Amen. I want to think about this this psalm and, and admit to you, like I, I, just, I bemoan to Elizabeth, my wife, this week. Like to me, preaching at Thanksgiving is always the hardest thing. You know, it's like I've been prescribed. You've got to preach about Thanksgiving, right? The week of Thanksgiving. And I don't like anybody telling me what to do. Uh, so it's weird for me. And and then it brings me to this psalm. And I'll be honest, I don't I don't really like preaching psalms. I've been I've, I've kind of forced myself to do it actually this last year. I've preached through several different types of psalms, and uh, as a learning experience for me. But I, I prefer a story. You know, give me a narrative. Give me something out of the Gospels. Give me something out of First Samuel. I'd like to take a story and bring it to life. And yet, here are this... This, here is this book of Psalms that needs to be addressed. It's deserving of our time, and I'm actually finding myself drawn to it more and more. So all of that is to tell you, like, this is a weird place for me. Because I'm preaching a, a, a message that, you know, the calendar kind of requires. And I'm preaching it out of a passage that's really not my first choice. And yet, God lays it in front of me. And here it is. I want you to think about it. Kind of set up this psalm. The, the context of this psalm is what, what speaks to me. Uh, and I hope that it will speak to you. This, this particular psalm is considered a psalm of thanksgiving or a thanksgiving psalm. It's a corporate thanksgiving psalm. And you know, and you've heard that. You know, psalms can be broken down into different uh, types, into different genres. And that's what this is. And this particular story, this particular poem expresses a problem. And then, of course, Yahweh's deliverance from that distress. So something has gone wrong, presumably. Presumably in King David's life, we believe he's the one that's written this and it comes from his perspective. And obviously God has provided for him and saved him from that distress. And this particular Thanksgiving psalm, like most of the larger corporate ones, is reserved for large life and death issues, which may be unusual for us. But I, I think you're going to enjoy the context, enjoy connecting that to what I hope Thanksgiving is for you this week. These particular types of psalms, these corporate Thanksgiving psalms, they're personal, but yet nondescript because they're used in corporate worship. 
This isn't the kind of psalm that you go home and, and read to yourself. It's the kind of psalm that's designed to be used in the temple, designed to be used in the synagogue, designed to be used by all of us in being able to offer Thanksgiving worship to God together. And I want you to, to, to I want to lay out for you like a procedure. And this is what was supposed to happen and what should have happened when this psalm was, was written and then how it would be used over and over again in the course of worship for God's people as they would come to the temple is a thankful person, someone who, who has had a distress, who something has gone wrong in their life and God has obviously provided for them, right? Something good has happened. That person would then take a voluntary peace offering to the temple, all right? So they would pick up an offering and, and would bring it to the temple, and they would bring their friends with them. And the, the, the goal and the purpose of that is to come to church, to have a moment of worship, and uh, through this, this offering, give thanks to God for what He has done, this deliverance that He has provided from whatever that distress. And they would bring the offering, and with their friends gathered there at the temple would then share this Thanksgiving psalm. They would either quote it or obviously have it pulled from a, from a scroll and would read this psalm together. And then this, friend, this, this Thanksgiving man and his friends would take the offering after it had been sacrificed and burned and, and cooked and then would have a feast over that offering as a way of celebrating what God had done. Like this was the procedure that was supposed to happen. So, so picture that. Like I have a terrible thing that happens in my life, whatever it is. And God has delivered me. God has provided in some way. And we see and I can then celebrate God has done something. I need to offer thanksgiving to God. The appropriate way to do that is through a peace offering. So I gather all of you. Hey, you're my friends. Y'all come with me. I'm going to sacrifice this lamb. And we're going to go to church. And we would sing or quote this psalm together in the temple while the offering is being cooked. Right? And then when it was over, we would take that offering and would feast together. And all of that, from the expression and the giving of the, the offering, to the actual burning of the offering, to the saying and recanting of the psalm together, even in the, the Thanksgiving feast that comes after, all of that is an expression of worship. From me, and also from you, my friends, to thank God for what He has done. And to me, the, the corporate nature of that is beautiful and it's palpable. Because among friends, among community, right, if God has done something gracious to my life, in a way He has done something gracious in your lives because we share life together. Because next year it's not going to be me who brings the offering, it's going to be you where God has done something phenomenal. And I'm going to come and celebrate with you the, the corporate sharing of the grace and the benevolence of God. To me is significant and is important and I think lays out a context for maybe what this week hopefully looks like for you. If you're like me, like our family's having a hard time making things get together, right? Like COVID makes things weird and wanting to keep my mom healthy and, you know, all the worries about that. But we're committed. You know, if something just doesn't mess us up Thursday, we're going to get together for lunch. We may sit across the room from each other, but we're going to at least see each other, right? Where we can all gather together, have a feast, and give thanksgiving to God for what he has done for the blessings that he has given us, even in the midst of a storm and of chaos. What I want to do is then just kind of walk through this psalm with you. Uh, and, and, and help you learn about it, help you think about what it is that, that David is telling us. There's theology here for us to learn, but, but hopefully in, in practical ways, like tee up for you what Thanksgiving may can look, for, look like for you this week. So start with me at the beginning. We'll reread it in chunks and in verse 1, it says, Give thanks to, to Yahweh, for He is good, His love endures forever. Let Israel say that His love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say His love endures forever. Let all those who fear Yahweh say His love endures forever. It's a psalm that's written by the king, most likely David. And this is kind of like a, an introduction. It's a call to the faithful of Israel to, to worship and to magnify Yahweh. The question, of course, is why? Well, that's what the next part is. And if you'll begin with me in verse 5. When hard pressed, I cried to Yahweh. He brought me into a spacious place. Yahweh is with me and I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Yahweh is with me. He is my helper. I look in triumph on my enemies. It is better to take refuge in Yahweh than to trust in humans. It is better to take refuge in Yahweh than to trust in princes. All the nations surrounded me, but in the name of Yahweh I cut them down. 
They surrounded me on every side, but in the name of Yahweh, I cut them down. They swarmed around me like bees, but they were consumed as quickly as burning thorns. In the name of Yahweh, I cut them down. I, I was pushed back and about to fall, but Yahweh helped me. Yahweh is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. What, it is, what is it that David has to come and give thanks to God to worship Yahweh for? Well, he's been in trouble, and God has delivered him. If you start like in verse 5, he says that he, he called to Yahweh when he was in trouble, when he had nobody else, nowhere else to return. And, and, and I find that is obviously a good idea. Like if you need a little nugget of lesson to come today, let verse 5 be it. That when you have nowhere else to turn, you turn to the Lord. Because he is the strong tower, right? He is the, the mighty hand in a time of trouble. He is the one who never goes away. We may go away. We may wander. We may feel like, where are God? Where are you? And he's constantly reminding us, I'm right here. I've never moved. You're the one who gets to, to wander and walk away. But I'm steadfast. I'm faithful. I'm always there. And David has learned that. He calls to God when he was in trouble, apparently having some time of military trouble, it would seem. He's on the brink of, of failure, but he, he calls to God, and God provides. God delivers. God works things out for him. And I love what happens in, in verse like 14, the ending thesis of that little section. It says that, that Yahweh, if y'all haven't caught on, you know, the, when the, the word the Lord is written in capital letters, that means the name of Yahweh is actually used there in the text. And I'm just weird enough. I like to translate that in my head. All right. Because in this particular passage, it seems more powerful to me. As we read this a minute ago, it, it struck me again that like just saying it out loud, how many times we hear the name of God himself. How many times has it come out? It's beautiful to me. But verse 14, Yahweh is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. I hear that as an echo of what is said like in verse 8. It's better to take refuge in Yahweh than to trust in humans. i got to read that again. It's, it's better to take refuge in Yahweh than to trust in humans. I told you last week, my heart's been broken by humans, right? By people who disagree with me, mistreat me, whatever, I don't know. How many times has your heart been broken by another man or another woman? Too many times. How many times has your heart been broken by God himself? Once. When he broke me of my sin and convinced me that I needed help. That conviction that led to salvation, that led to redemption. It's the only time my heart was broken. It was a necessary break, right? God healed me by breaking me. But other than that, I've never been disappointed in God. He's never let me down. He's never left me hanging. I've never thought, man, I'd be better off trusting someone else. How powerful it is for, for David to say this in the midst of a military battle. Like he's having this conflict. Obviously, he's, he's having some kind of fight. Something's not going well. And he says, I'm not going to trust in my commanders. They continue to let me down, but God never does. So I take refuge in him because he never fails me. He trusts in God and finds trusting in God is better than trusting in humans. And it says, God, take care of me. Because God never fails me. God never disappoints. So he wants to come and offer thanksgiving because of this great tribulation that he's had and God showing himself to be faithful. But he's not done. Pick up again in, in verse 15. He, he says, Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. Yahweh's right hand has done mighty things. Yahweh's right hand is lifted high. Yahweh's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live and will proclaim what Yahweh has done. Yahweh has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. This is the, the voice of a man of victory on the backside of a struggle. All right? This is a man that's now looking back over a military campaign or a time of darkness or difficulty or a storm, if we want to steal the language from last week, and he's seeing the hand of God. You probably remember hearing me praying about that a few minutes ago. That may be hard to do this year, but I guarantee you it may be 2021. It may be 2022. <laughs> But at some point, we will look back on 2020 and we will see the hand of God in this. We will see how he moved. We'll see how he protected and provided. We'll see how he positioned his churches for great revival and for ministry. Then I'll be honest, most of our churches don't look like that right now, right? Most of our churches are struggling. They're, they're, they're barely able to, to fill the building. They're barely able to pay the bills because people aren't coming. And one day we're going to look back and we'll see how God was establishing something 
He was preparing us for a new day of ministry, a new day of kingdom work and expanse. That's where David is. He's on the back side of that, now looking back and saying how God has protected him, so he celebrates with praise and, and with worship. And I, and I want you to just chew on this. If we were like sitting around at a table, I'd ask you the question and we would just discuss it. In verse 15, he says, Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. I, I wonder what a shout of joy and victory sounds like. I don't know. But chew on that for a second. What does a shout of joy and victory sound like? Is it a yippee? Is it a squeal? It is a yell? Is it a curse word you're not supposed to say in the church, right? Like, what does a sound of joy sound like? And, and I'm, I'm betting it's different for all of us, right? But whatever that would be for you, like when you have one of those, <clears throat> that's kind of mine. It's like, yes. I tend not to let it out. Why? Well, I just. Right there, and it comes, my face turns red, and it makes me feel better. That's a sound of, of joy and of victory for me. I'm sure it was different for David in a very different culture. I bet they were loud. I bet they were raucous. I bet they were shaking the walls of the temple, right? Exclaiming, in fact, look at what God has done. Because, as a matter of fact, if, if you step back and try to see this in context, like David is king over Israel, probably having this great military trouble. Now he's had a great military might. It's not just David and a couple of his friends coming to the temple to celebrate and worship what God has done. It's the entire nation of Israel coming together at the throne room of God saying, God, whatever this battle was, we thought we were going to lose it. And then we reminded ourselves, oh, yes, trust in Yahweh, the one who parts waters and tears down walls, right? And they did. And he brought Wealth and victory, and the whole nation then comes together. This was a raucous celebration. This was a nation celebrating victory that was pulled out of the jaws of defeat. That's what their sound sounded like. We got to remember, like whatever David's dealing with, he calls it as a, a problem of life or death. These are big picture problems that God has solved here for them. So they celebrate with noise, with raucousness, and. Verse 17, David then says, I, I won't die, but I'll live. That's good. And we'll proclaim what Yahweh has done. I will proclaim what Yahweh has done. Isn't this the proper response to God's saving grace? Hear that from a man that's consistently evangelistic in nature, in my understanding of what the church is to be about, right? To proclaim what God has done. Not just to one another, but to those he's still wanting to do it for. This is the proper response to the saving grace of God as proclamation. God has saved me. God has redeemed me. God has taken a dirty wretch like me and has brought victory from it. However phrasing you want to do to point back to what Jesus has done in your life, we all have that in common. We all have that to proclaim. We all have that to give thanks for this year, even if you can't think of anything else. If you can literally think of nothing else to give thanksgiving for this year, there is that. That Christ has saved you, and you didn't deserve that at all. Thanks be to God. We proclaim what God has done. And David shows us what that looks like, that we, we proclaim. And, and then I want you to see what happens in, in verse 19. All right. So now we're, we're getting into like movement and corporate things. Like He says, open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to Yahweh. This is the gate of Yahweh through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me and you have become my salvation. He wants admittance to the temple, to this tent of God. He wants to come in and, and praise God and do the whole thing in the church. And basically what I hear him saying is, is, is thank you, God. Thank you for caring for me. Thank you for protecting me. David has come to church in order to give thanks to God for something he's done outside of church, for protecting and providing for him in this, this military problem. To me, that's pretty significant for those of us sitting in church on a Sunday morning to think that David came to church to give thanks to God. We come to church. Why? Why? hopefully, to give thanks to God. My family is kind of worrying about that. My, <laughs> it's actually funny. Uh, my family was going to go with some friends and, and just visit a church there in Rankin County and try something different, right? Like that's what they were doing and uh, going with some friends that were going there. And I had to drive an hour over here to come into worship with you. And we actually left at the same time because their church starts that early. And my kids were hating that idea, right? And I was like, ha whatever. But I've thought about that the whole way over here is like, my, you know, 
situation in my life. My family were split up at the moment. My wife and my kids are worshiping somewhere, and I'm over here worshiping with you, and my parents don't get to be here because of things. And then I thought, like, what are we, what are we doing? Like, why would we do that, right? Almost every Sunday of my life, I've gone to church either because someone paid my dad to or someone paid me to, right? Why are we doing this? And it kind of breaks it down to the basics. I come to church because that's who I am. I'm a follower of God who needs to, even if I'm not sure how to say it, come to him on a regular basis to give thanksgiving to God for what he has done. That's what we're here for. We give thanks to God for what he has done. We proclaim to one another and we proclaim to the world around us what God has done. I want you to see that's what David's doing. He's saying, you know, open up the gate of the righteous. Let the righteous come into the temple so that I can do exactly what you and I have gathered here to do. To proclaim what God has done. He's brought salvation. To celebrate it. To give thanksgiving for it. We don't stay here. At some point we go back home. And we keep proclaiming that. And, and we'll see that. For, David does that as well. But he makes a point to come. To come to church to give thanks to God. And he does it in front of everybody. I love this in verse 22. Like you get the corporate nature of it. And, and the people are, are watching what's happening here. And He gives this, this, this passage. This is, you may not have known this is where this came from. But the stone the builder rejected has become the cornerstone. Who's he talking about? Is he talking about himself? Well, in context here, yeah. The stone the builder rejected has become the the cornerstone. Yahweh has done this, and it's marvelous in our days. Yahweh has done it in this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. What's David saying? Like, Like God is doing something in my life, the king of the people of Israel, that otherwise had been rejected. He's like, you know, this stone that had been rejected by those who think they know better, God has said, no, I will build something out of this. At first, he's talking about himself, but don't we know that there's more to that passage? David didn't even know what he was probably writing at the moment, but the stone the builder rejected has become the cornerstone. He's talking about Christ. Christ, who comes, faces difficulty, has heartache, has trouble, turns to the Lord, and God delivers him three days later. He has great victory and great triumph. And then he gathers his friends as they come and celebrate with me what God has done, not just for me, but but for you. Uh, I, that would actually be worth uh, maybe a whole other sermon to see a parallel between what David is writing and doing here with Christ's life and what he has done and how he then includes us in that celebration. The stone the builder rejected has become the cornerstone. Yahweh has done this. Not me, not David, not anything special or, or that I can point to. Yahweh has done this. It is marvelous in our eyes. Yahweh has done it this very day. So let us rejoice and be glad. And then it's almost like he turns. He recognizes what it is. He's like, I'm going to keep I'm going to keep this going. So then he turns to almost to proclamation. Yahweh, save us. Yahweh, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh. From the house of Yahweh, we bless you. Yahweh is God and he's made his light shine on us with bows in his hand joined in the festal possession up to the horn of the altar blessed is King David and blessed are we because of him is what we're hearing like like from verse 26 blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord he's talking about himself but not only about himself is he We see proclamations of Christ there who comes in the name of the Lord we also see foreshadowings of us who come in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord to proclaim what God has done. What an excellent description of a Christian who comes to town and comes to work and goes to the grocery store to proclaim what God has done in my life. Blessed is that person. And I love how, like, you, you get the sense that the, the tense of the, the language has changed. You know, verse 25, he's proclaiming, Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And it's almost as if David's not saying this anymore. It's almost as if the crowd is saying, like, David is writing what the group around him that he has brought to this great festival is saying. The people join. 
in King David's thanks. The people join in King David's praise. This is the part where I have brought you to church to celebrate with me. And it's now no, no, not just about me and my celebration. You have gotten involved with it. Blessed is this. Thank you, God. Save us, God. Corporately, the church has now gathered here at the end to give thanks and praise to God for what he has done. And then David closes it with a personal exhortation of the greatness of Yahweh. You are my God. And it's interesting to me he changes names there. Like he doesn't call him Yahweh anymore. It's not about particularly who God is. It's about the role that Yahweh plays in David's life. You are the one who commands me. You are the one who owns me. You are the one who guides and directs me. You are the one who provides and protects me. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. So give thanks to who? To Yahweh, my God, for he is good, and his love endures forever. I told you that Thanksgiving is weird for me, and I bet it's weird for all of us this year. Like, this is going to be an unusual week for all of us in some way, even just in logistics. But I want you to let this, this psalm kind of speak to you about thanking God for what he has done. And hopefully you, in, in times of reflection and of prayer this week, you're going to be able to stop and say, yeah, I see where God has moved here. I see where God has provided here. I see where God has, has done things in my life here. And I may not have noticed them before, and I need to stop and give thanksgiving to God. That's what this week is for. But if not, even just in the big picture for salvation, blessings, deliverance, hope. That's the whole purpose of Thanksgiving. That's the whole purpose of this week, particularly in a spiritual role. That's the whole purpose of coming to church on a regular basis is to stop and give thanks to God for the things that he has done and see how David then brings his friends with him to, to church to give thanks to God. It's an appropriate function of the church house. It's an appropriate function of the church family to gather together and to give thanks to God. And here's what's going to be cool for, for, for you and for us is this week we're kind of teeing this up, thinking about giving thanks to God. And I mean, I hope you dwell on this all week and you get to Thursday and you take a minute and you think about who God is and what he's done and think about all the things God has done. And we want to give thanks to him. And then next week we gather back together for worship and we're going to do the Lord's Supper and we're going to give thanks to God and we're going to do it tangibly with bread and juice giving thanks to God for what he has done. So over the course of this week, we started kind of this, this arch, I think, for us to think about the big picture of what God has done. And I hope it delves into the peculiars and details of your life, of what God is doing in your life this week, what's happening in your family, what's happening in your loved ones and your friends. And then it peaks back up again next week as we go back to the big picture of the Lord's Supper and think, look at what God has done for us for all of us in this large picture of salvation and to give thanks to God for that. We see it in the psalm that church family joins together with David in thanksgiving to share strife, to share blessings, to share praise together. So I want to encourage you in this next week to, to think and express to God thanksgiving for what he has done for you. Start with the big picture and allow him and challenge him to bring you to the, to the smaller, finite picture. And allow your friends and your families to join in that thanksgiving with you. To take some way, and you know, on Thursday, I don't know about you, like Thursday is chaos for us. It's cooking the food, then eating the food, then putting the food up, and then recovering from the food so you can have food again, right? Even in the preacher's family, we often find a hard time making room for the Lord on Thanksgiving Day. Try. Take five minutes to stop and allow your family to think, where have you seen God working? In what ways can we give thanksgiving to God? Start with Christ and come down from there. And see what the Lord will bring to your mind and see if you can't then recreate what David does with his friends here to say, God has done something for me. And I've gathered my family together and we've offered this, this sacrifice, this feast. And together we're going to thank God for what he's done in my life and in your life and in our life together. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for this psalm. 
for the way that I, I know it challenges me. It, it pushes me out of something that is normal and comfortable for me. And it sets the stage so beautifully for what this week should look like for us. To gather together with the people that we love, the people that we share life together with, and to reflect on how good you have been, to reflect on your many blessings. Would you help me to do that? Would you help each family represented here to do that? To, in some way and in some schedule of a thing this week, to, to stop and to recount, to examine, to think, to meditate, to dwell on what you have done for them and in their lives this year. Allow us to then change our perspective and change the narrative of the year of all years from one of bemoaning and of frustration and of anger and of fear to one of thanksgiving and of praise and of celebration because we've seen you there the whole time and we can reflect on how you have been faithful to us the whole time to give you praise for that and to proclaim it to the world around us that in the hardest of hearts you have been there and have been good and through that, God, that you would bring us to, to praise, that you would bring others to you and to salvation. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have a, our benediction. Now, y'all tell me. Do y'all usually stand for this? Yeah. Awesome. I don't want to mess that up. Let's stand for our benediction from 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. And through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of Him everywhere. Amen.